Hi, and welcome back to Chase's Everything Shooting. Today's episode is an interview with the pros from Hodgton, and they are going to be talking about different powders, what's going on in the powder industry, some of the things to look for when your powder starts to degrade, just some of the questions that have come through the channel. Sit back and relax and enjoy. Welcome back to Chase's Everything Shooting. I have the guys from uh, Hogden coming in and they're going to talk about all the questions you've given me about gunpowder. And they're the experts and I'm going to let them start. Aaron, I'd like you to say a little bit about uh, your company and a little bit of history, and then we'll get over to Luke. Sure, absolutely. Well, thanks for having us on. I appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I work for Hodgton Gunpowder. Uh, so we are obviously in the gunpowder business. We kind of refer to ourselves as the gunpowder people. Uh, we've been in this business for over 75 years now. This is our 76th year. And uh, something that we're pretty pr proud to play in this in this sandbox. Most of us uh, here at Hodgton are hand loaders. Uh, most of us have been doing it for a little while. Some to uh, some very ex various experience levels, if you will. Um, but gunpowder and and hand loading is something we're pretty passionate about. Hodgton over the years has kind of morphed as a company. The Hodgton uh, Powder Company now owns multiple brands in the smokeless space. So if you think about Hodgton, IMR. Uh, our brands that we own. We purchased the IRMR brand uh, nearly 20 years ago now, and we've licensed the Winchester brand from the Olin Corporation for the last 17 or 18 years or so. Um, so we kind of own and license those brands, and then we bought Western Powder several years ago as well. So when we bought Western, we got accurate ram shots. So we manage five smokeless brands, Hodgton, IMR, Winchester, accurate ram shot, and then we are also in the muzzle loading business as well. So we have a uh, triple seven pirate X white hots and black horn. So that's a lot of powder for a company to be involved in. And something that uh, we we are pretty excited to get to come to work every day and, and deal in powder. So that's kind of who we are. Uh, my name's Aaron again, and I work in the sales and marketing department, even though we have a lot of brands that we manage, we're a pretty small company. Uh, we're based just outside of Kansas city. We have, a uh, warehouse and manufacturing facility in Kansas. And then we have another uh, facility up in Montana. So pretty, pretty small, all in all, less than 100 employees. So I think we definitely qualify as a small business, but powder is all we do and something we're pretty passionate about. I also have Luke with me and he's going to answer some of the more technical questions in a minute, but uh, Luke manages our technical team. So we handle lots of phone calls and emails every day that come in from people asking all types of different questions. So if, if there's somebody who's heard it all, it's probably Luke and he would be the guy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks, Aaron. Hey, well, while I've got you, um, are you guys experiencing any supply chain issues or problems, you know, getting the, the product you need to, to put in your gunpowder? Sure. Absolutely. And we have been for four or five years. It's, it's the standard uh, situation for our business, as many businesses in America are facing right now, over what we've seen since COVID, right? So we have a lot of uh, supply chain issues. Fortunately, we've managed to figure our way through most of those challenges. We've had a lot of challenges, especially getting uh, raw materials from Australia. One of our big suppliers is in Australia, and we have worked really hard over the last three or four years in getting consistent supply coming in from Australia. That We've done a pretty good job of, but it, it's a never ending problem. Trying to import anything into the U.S. right now is, is a challenge. Um, that particularly is the case with nitrocellulose. Um, we have been uh, working on that problem for the last several years uh, with nitrocellulose and what that means. And fortunately, we've seen a lot more demand coming from the military side of the business. And while military isn't something that we uh, that is a big deal for our company, they are needing a lot of propellants that require nitrocellulose. And so that is, uh, that's requiring a lot of that supply to go to that side of uh, the demand curve. And um, we've been really working hard to make sure that we have other ways around that. So nitrocellulose is something we pay attention to. And there's other ingredients that we pay attention to as well. But 
Yeah, we're always focused on uh, on supply chain issues. It seems like for the last three or four years now, that's been something that keeps us up at night, and we want to make sure that we're staying on top of. Well, thank you. It's that's a that's a big question. Of course, we're starting to see a little bit more starting to come through, uh, and inventories getting a little bit larger at the at the gun shops and at the shows and stuff. But it's still not like it was before COVID. That's for sure. Absolutely. And and we're, we're, we're pretty familiar with, um, I mean, I do a lot of retail, retail store checks in my job. So I'm in the retail store environment quite a bit, just checking in with our customers. Um, and, and I see the same thing. We, What I would say is over the last three or four years, since 2000, what we really saw was a demand curve that took off and went nearly vertical, right? So when you think about the supply, we really haven't had supply issues for the last four years. It's been all on the demand side of the house. So what we saw was that demand went nearly vertical and that's now starting to be kind of restored to normalcy. The good news for us is we've gotten a lot of powder. We've shipped record amounts of powder over the last three consecutive years. So 2020, 2021 and 2022, we shipped record amounts of powder to our customers. Every year they got more. We're shipping way more powder today than we were back in 2017, 18, and 19. So we'll continue to ship those types of, uh, of supplies to the marketplace as long as that demand is there. But we have seen demand start to normalize just a little bit. But the reality in our business is that that can change on a dime, right? So that could change tomorrow. And then if demand takes back up, uh, it will be hard to find gunpowder on the shelves. But Right now, I've been out the last 30 to 60 days doing a lot of retail store checks, and you can pretty much find what you need at most stores uh, that are available today. The challenge is that it's a lot more expensive. We've seen a lot of price increases from our suppliers, and while we've tried to keep that, uh, we've tried to keep that reasonable, we've tried to minimize those price increases, we have had to take price increases on our side. And and we know that that impacts the average person walking in to, in to buy a pound of powder. So we're we're keeping that in the forefront of our minds every day. Um, powder supply is getting better, but we know it costs more. All right. Well, thanks. That's a that's a great information to have because definitely it's been a little bit tough for us reloaders out there uh, looking for product. So uh, hey, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you guys are stepping up and making it happen. I'm. Hearing the supply chain is an issue everywhere and throughout the whole industry. So uh, I, I get that. And as an old business owner, I understand, hey, you know what? You have to make a profit to stay in business. So unfortunately, I don't want to pay more. But hey, you know what? Charge me what you need to to stay in business. Absolutely. So, I'm so okay, okay, so let's let's get over here to Luke. Luke, thanks for, for taking your time out of your day. I know you're probably, if you're on the phone, you're probably answering a lot of questions. And these are probably ones you get all the time. So, uh, but they've been coming in through the channel and I just wanted to uh, get them out there and get the expert to tell us the best, best answers. And then the first question is, is how long does uh, powder last? So smokeless powder has a rough, 30 to 40 year chemical lifespan. Uh, that's if stored properly. Storage is the big thing here. Heat is the biggest enemy of powder. So we want to keep that in a controlled environment. You know, 80 degrees or less is going to be fine. Uh, try to avoid anything that's an outbuilding garage, uh, you know, anywhere that it would be exposed to those summer temperatures. Um, it can last longer than 30 to 40 years without showing any signs that it's going bad and still shoot well. Uh, you know, but it, it may be something you don't see right away that it's starting to go bad, but that's that's kind of the time frame we're looking at. Okay. Yeah, what we say at Hodgson is that we you really need to treat powder the way you treat yourself, right? So nobody wants to live in a really hot or a really cold garage. Nobody wants to deal with humidity. We all kind of want to live and be comfortable, you need to treat powder the same way. Um, I, you know, a lot of us here, I've been hand loading for a little bit and I have powder in um, in my powder supply that my dad gave me back in the late eighties. So certainly powder can last a long time, but you gotta be careful and checking at it. And we'll go into that in a second. You, you need to check your powder and make sure that it's okay before you go ahead and try to load it. 
Okay, well, that that just takes us right into the next question: is is there visible degradation, and what do we look for? When when it starts to go bad, it'll start to turn a rusty reddish brown color. A lot of people think uh, my powder has rust in it, but that's just what the powder does when it starts to go bad. Uh, that's going to be an obvious sign. A lot of people, when they pour it out of that bottle into the hopper, a dust will kind of form up out of there, and that usually leads to a phone call saying, "Hey." I saw this, is my powder still good? No, that's that's the sign that it's gone bad. So uh, watch for that. Any of those powders that are older that you have around that they've hit that 30 year mark, I would say go ahead and inspect them once or twice a year. Uh, look for that sign that they've gone bad. And you just wanna keep on top of that because once they go bad, they're gonna start to emit a corrosive residue that comes out of there, a gas that's gonna start coming off of it. That's going to be corrosive. So if you've got that, uh, you know, in with reloading equipment or something, once it goes bad, it, it can start to be a problem. Well, that's that's good. I, I do have a question here, though, that we didn't have on our list is I have some old gunpowder that came in the old tin cans. And, uh, you know, I noticed that when I opened it, it didn't it, it had a kind of a weird smell. And so is, is there a, when they start degrading, does there a, a smell change or anything like that? There is. Uh, so it should have a kind of an acetone type smell, a, chem a, a chemical smell that you're familiar with. When it goes bad, that will start to kind of turn to, some people describe it as a bleach smell or an acidic smell. It will usually be very strong. It'll burn your nose, make your eyes water. Uh, you won't be able to, to stand it. So it should be an obvious sign. Um, a lot of that older powder, guys will call in, they'll say, well, it's still sealed. Whether it's sealed or not has no effect on its lifespan. Uh, it's going to go bad over time uh, regardless. So don't be afraid to pull that seal and go ahead and look at the powder. Wow, I didn't know that. That's that's great to know. Now, when powder loses, starts losing its performance, is that when it starts to break down and when you have the smells and the and the rust look or will it just over every so many years lose a little bit some of its performance? Uh, so what it, it should hold that performance until it starts to go bad. Now it may start chemically changing before it shows obvious signs that it's gone bad. Uh, that's not going to happen overnight. So one of those things, just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, but you shouldn't notice any big changes. If you do, though, that that may be a sign that it's it's on its way to a turning point. And after it starts changing, it's going to go through different chemical processes. So it's going to start. It, it definitely isn't the powder you bought. It's it's now changing. So uh, what it is now may be totally different than what it is six months down the road or a year down the road after it starts to go bad. Okay, so. We, we kind of, you kind of already hit on the storage part, but we want to keep it cool. We want to keep it dry. Um, and you, and you'd said about 80 degrees, that's about the maximum you want it uh, on the high side. That's correct. Uh, another thing I want to mention is sometimes customers will ask if they should add a desiccant pack or something like that. Powder should have some humidity in it. And you don't really need to work. We say a cool, dry place, but you don't really need to worry about it picking up too much moisture. What we really don't want is to artificially remove the moisture that should be in there. So we do not recommend the desiccant packs. We do not want to store it next to a dehumidifier. Uh, just leave it in the, the factory bottle, you know, with the, the foam seal on there. And that, that should keep the moisture level where it should be. If powder does become excessively dried out, it can increase in burn speed. So if you live in a very dry climate, say 20% humidity or less, uh, sometimes people will see higher pressure from, from powder that's been stored that way. Uh, another thing I would mention is don't store powder in your powder thrower hopper. Uh, after each reloading session, go ahead and, re and, and unload that, put it back in the factory container. Not all plastic is created equal. A lot of powders contain nitroglycerin. That is going to chemically react with most plastics they use for, for powder hoppers. Anything that you can see through uh, will usually have a chemical reaction. So uh, definitely get it back into that original bottle. 
Well, I, I live in Texas, so I've got the humidity. So <laughs> no way around that one for sure for me. I wish it was a little drier, but uh, that's just not the case. Okay, so uh, there's been some questions, and I, I thought about it myself too. Why the different types of powder, the granules? Some are flakes, some are rounds, some are cylinders. There's, I mean, there's just a lot of different ones out there. And, and can you give us a little bit of an idea of what the theory is behind that? Okay. So there's basically two methods of manufacturing powder. We have spherical powders and we have extruded powders. So extruded powders, uh, your, your shot shell and pistol type powders, those are usually what people refer to as a flake. Uh, and then when you get into rifle powders, a lot of people call those stick powders, but they're both manufactured the same way. Spherical powders, on the other hand, they're, they're very fine grains. Uh, they kind of all look the same. Nearly all of them are flattened to some degree, so people can sometimes call those a flake, but they're much finer than what an extruded flake powder would look like. Interesting. Well, that's, is it, you're saying it's extruded. Is it extruded under pressure or is it, is it a liquid form? How is that extruded? It would be a semi-solid form that is okay. extruded through a, through a die and cut. Uh, so that's how you see your different, your different geometry of, of kernels and stick powder. Uh, we do that. That's one method of controlling burn speed. So that's why you see the different different oh. variations and sizes. Oh, that's that's good to know. Okay, so um, I really that's kind of touched on all those questions I've had. If you have Luke, if you have anything else that comes in that that from the your phone calls, let me know. Do you do you have any other questions that have been really prevalent? We get just about everything you could imagine here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think my first week I saw a brass cannon from the 1600s. You know, uh, you, you never know what somebody's going to send you a photo of. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And then, um, Aaron, you wanted to do you do you have any new powders coming out? Anything new happening uh, with you guys that we need to know about? Yeah, always. So we're we're continually working on new powders to introduce, um, mostly so we can kind of upgrade our current line, if you will. You know, we have a lot of favorites out there that we haven't touched for years, but we are always kind of working on on standard burn speed powders. Um, the Hodgden Extreme line is probably our uh, that's our number one selling line, and that those are powders like. Uh, Varget 4350, um, Rotumbo H1000, uh, powders like that. Um, those are our, uh, some of our top powders and they sell really well. Um, but we also introduced an Ender Online um, several years ago and we are not able to uh, currently bring that Ender Online to market. Lots of reasons for that. That's some of the supply chain issues that we talked about. We really haven't had those uh, had those that line from the IMR fam or from the IMR brand in the marketplace for over a year now, almost two years. Um, so what we have done is several years ago we started working on a new uh, family under the Winchester brand that we have recently started introducing products in. It's the Stable family. So it's a ball powder that is temperature insensitive, and that's the first time that that combination has has been introduced. We introduced that in the Stable Six Five. Uh, burn speed several years ago that came out three years ago and then earlier this year at SHOT Show we introduced Stable HD uh, so that would be more of a Rotumbo burn speed and Stable Match that would be more of a Varget type burn speed and so that's that three uh, product family now has become well one of our top sellers very very quickly and if you think about it that works right so if you're loading um Two two three. If you're loading, uh, you know some other burn speeds that you would want to do that on a on a uh, progressive press. It's a ball powder, so it's going to meter really really well, but it still gives you the features like temperature insensitivity that we want today. So those burn, those three burn speeds are something that we've had uh, we've had in the marketplace now. That two of them are brand new, and the third one is is less than three years old. And we're continuing to work on that family, trying to analyze if we want to bring out new burn speeds for that. So I would say watch our website over the next several years, and, and there's a strong possibility we would introduce another 
another member of that family. We're also working really hard right now on the shot shell side. Uh, there's some shot shell powders that we have just not been able to get to market over the last several years. Those are uh, shot shell powders like Clay's International, Universal, 700X to, to some extent. And so we're working on uh, very, very quickly on new shot shell powders to get those to market. And I would say stay attention, stay, uh, pay attention to our website over the next a month or two, and we'll probably have more news about that as well. So it, it's interesting to work in the powder market. In a lot of ways, things have never changed, right? We have a lot of top sellers out there who, you know, I've been loading 4831 for uh, most of my life now, but uh, I, I love some of our new powders as well. I love loading with CFE223 and these new stable family powders that we've introduced really, really work well. And so in a lot of ways, things never change, but in a lot of ways, things still change every day. So there's never a dull moment at Hodgson Powder Company. Well, that's great. Well, as a, as a uh, trap shooter, uh, I'll be looking for your for that powder to come out. I do that quite a bit. Of course, everybody goes, oh, I don't know why you reload. It's, you know, it's cheaper really to buy the shells. And I do it just because I had the consistency. I get the same sure. consistency every time. So um, it's not really all about the money, it's the consistency. So, and you know what, if, if it gets me another clay, it gets me another clay, that's all that counts. Absolutely. And you know, it's something to, to keep you engaged in the sport, right? So there's a lot of times where you can't be out shooting, but you can load. There's a lot of times that you can't be out fishing, but you can tie your own flies. It's just part of the lifestyle that we live, right? It, it is definitely. Well, I just want to say thank you very much for taking time out of both of your busy days. I know it took me a little time to get this all arranged because you've been having all those uh, different the NRA shows and the shot shows and you've probably been showed out. So I appreciate you uh, wedging me in here and taking care of this. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that have the same questions that have asked and they're, they're, we're really going to have a true answer instead of what someone thinks it is. So thank you very much, uh, Aaron and Luke. We appreciate that. And uh, I'll be talking to you again. And we'll, we'll do another update. Happy to do it. Thanks for your time today. Thank you.